This is Puerto Galera in the Philippines. I've been coming here for over a decade. For me, it's like a second home. This is when I'm happiest, when I'm diving. I can just chill out and relax. The only noise, the sound of my own bubbles. I love the amazing colors of the creatures and corals underwater. And you never know what you'll bump into next. Yet I don't know how much longer I can carry on diving. I have MS, multiple sclerosis, a disease that attacks my central nervous system. MS symptoms range from mild tingling in the skin to total paralysis of the arms and legs. Right now, it's incurable. Let's get more from Stephanie Scowan, who's- My name is Stephanie Scowan. I'm a reporter and producer for Al Jazeera in the Asia Pacific region. I've been a television journalist for 20 years. I love working in the field, covering news stories from around the world. I'm single, I'm tough, and very independent. I live here in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. I've had MS for 17 years. But until two years ago, you wouldn't have noticed anything wrong with me. My symptoms were mild and invisible to others, so I kept my illness secret. Then in 2011, my left leg failed to recover from an MS attack. Dead slow is now my fastest speed. It's hard for me to admit, even to myself, that I'm disabled. My biggest fear is I'm going to end up in a wheelchair. And that's why I'm making this film, to see if I can stop that from happening. You never know when you're going to have an MS attack. They're completely unpredictable. So the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is check. Does everything feel right? Is anything not working properly? I'm one of around two and a half million people worldwide with multiple sclerosis. Many have never heard of the disease. Most people in Malaysia assume I've hurt my leg in an accident. I have to explain it's not my leg that's damaged, it's my brain. MS is an autoimmune disease which means my body attacks itself. It destroys myelin, a protective sheath that covers the nerves in my brain and spine. Now, you can imagine myelin like the protective cover on an electrical wire. Now, in an MS attack, that myelin is destroyed uh, like the frayed cord of my iron here, exposing the nerves underneath to potential damage. Myelin also acts as a superconductor helping send messages from the brain to other parts of my body. But when there's damage, those messages can't get through properly. So something simple like picking up a cup of coffee might take me longer or my hands might shake. There are different types of multiple sclerosis. Like most people, I've got the relapsing remitting kind, which means I get attacks followed by periods of remission when the symptoms go away. But often that can turn into the progressive kind when you don't recover and just get more and more disabled. And that's what I'm scared will happen to me. So I've been reading up on the latest research to find out if it's possible to prevent that. Some reports suggest that scientists are close to a cure. I need to find out if that's true. I also want to know how I got MS. It's not infectious, so why me? One theory is that I may have inherited it genetically. There's only one way to find out, and that's a DNA test. Ow! 
I'm giving a blood sample so scientists can test to see if I'm genetically predisposed to getting MS. It'll take a few weeks for the results to come back. Meanwhile, I'm off to the UK, where I was born and where much of the cutting-edge research into MS is taking place. My first destination, the Orkney Islands, in the far north of Scotland. MS is a mysterious illness. Although first identified over 150 years ago, its causes remain unclear. But recent research in Orkney may help to provide some of the answers. I'm here to meet Dr. Jim Wilson. He heads a team from Edinburgh University. Hi, you must be Stephanie. Hello, yes I am, Jim. Hi. Hi, nice to meet you. They've been carrying out a study of multiple sclerosis in the Orkney Islands for over two years. It's, I'm glad the sun's out, it's a bit nippy, yeah. quite honestly, for me, anyway. So. Jim was born here and is proud of his heritage. Yeah, okay. He offers to show me round so while we talk. I'm going to take you and show you the sights, sure, if you want. Sure, cool, that would be really good. Can I borrow your arm? OK, like, how do I do it? Hang on, I'll hold you. Like Maybe this? That way. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Is that OK? Yep, yep, yep. It's just over here, so... Lovely. Ah, too far away. now here comes so the awkward here, okay. bit, yeah. getting into his car. This might be interesting, but we'll see. Hold Sometimes on, if my leg, my leg plays up, it can be quite exciting getting in a car. So should I hold you or...? Uh, no, it's probably wait for me to lose my patience. I don't like accepting the help of others. Right. I'm stubborn like that. This is quite a high up one. Damn it. Do you need a hand? No, it's when my knee doesn't want to bend. Right, I'm in. Okay. Cool. I'll shut this. It's true what they say. When two British people meet, the first thing they talk about is the weather. So it'll um, be a big difference in temperature from Malaysia. Uh, yeah. Um, I just don't experience temperatures like this, and it's like, oh, my God. Oh, so you've been living in the warmth. Yeah, exactly. And you but I was about to discover that Orkney's cold climate is one of the clues in the mystery of the causes of MS. So we're just going to park up. OK. And I will show you a really nice view of Stromer. Excellent. All right. See, it's nice to look at the, the sun and the water. Yeah, no, it's, it's sunny, but, oh, cold. So how do we do steps? Uh, slowly. Okay. Everything is slow with me. Oh, God. Steep slopes, steps, nightmare. Should I hold on to you more, or is that fine? Uh, just, <laughs> yes, use your judgment. Just save me falling over backside. Luckily, the view's worth it. <sighs> Beautiful. Isn't it? Well, we're here in Orkney because uh, people have long thought that Orkney has the highest prevalence, so the highest rate of multiple sclerosis of anywhere in the world. And we've just carried out a study, a proper scientific count of the people, and we've shown that to be true. It is the hot spot. Yeah. So a typical rate, let's say, in England might be very roughly 150 people mm. per 100,000 who have it. Yeah. We measured the rate here in Orkney at 402 per 100,000. So it's really dramatically higher. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty... I mean, I know uh, just from what my doctor has uh, said to me in Malaysia that it's extremely rare in Malaysia, but why is it so high here and so low there? Well, it's a very interesting question. Um, it's partly a very European disease, a disease of European people, mm. but it, it shows a very clear relationship with how far away from the equator people are, with latitude. Mm. So it's much more common in the far north than it is in the tropical areas of the world. So that's why it's probably very rare um, in Malaysia. Um, you know, I think, I believe we're north of Moscow. It's, it's really, really quite far north. Yeah. It's very dark here in winter. Really? How come the, um, the relevance of where you are on the planet, how far north you are, makes such a big difference then? Well, it's not very well understood. It's clearly to do with sunlight. Uh, and most people think it's to do with vitamin D. So vitamin D is, some people call it the sunshine vitamin. Um, if you expose your skin to light, to sunlight, uh, it's made in your skin. You can get it from the diet as well, yeah. um, from oily fish, from meat and eggs, but the main source is sunlight. Dr Wilson's team measured the levels of vitamin D in the blood of 2,000 Orkney residents. 
including people with MS. The findings, as yet unpublished, are convincing. It was significantly lower on average in the, the MS patients. So it does show that same pattern that we see in other places where vitamin D seems to be considerably lower in patients. I live in Malaysia, obviously, lots of sunshine. Um, my symptoms have actually remained really, really mild, considering I've had it for 17 years. Should all MS patients just move somewhere sunny? Or what, what I mean, what's, what do you, what's your opinion on that? I mean, it's early days and it's unproven, but there's a lot of evidence now and I personally think uh, that the link is, is nearly proven. I think uh, that vitamin D is very important in MS. It could help to prevent MS. It also might help to reduce the symptoms of multiple sclerosis to slow down the progression going forward. And if I uh, were diagnosed, I wouldn't hesitate to be taking vitamin D supplementation or indeed uh, seeking, seeking some sunshine. Oh, so, will we... Shall we? Go somewhere warmer. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Hang yeah. On. I'll get that for you. Wow, look at that surf. That's amazing. How often is it like that? Quite often. Uh, that's the Atlantic Ocean. You know, there's nothing between us and America. Wow. And this is the island of Hoi here, okay. the High Island. Um, another one of the, of the islands of Orkney. So we have Neolithic late Stone Age um, standing stones, very, very ancient, from about, I think, 3000 BC. These are... I'm thoroughly enjoying my tour with possibly the most highly qualified guide in Scotland. God, they're huge, aren't they? But it's time to find out more about Jim's real specialty, the genetics of multiple sclerosis. His team took DNA samples from 2000 people living in Orkney and looked for common genetic variants in a subsection of people with MS. I'm keen to find out what they discovered. Uh, oh, my God! <laughs> I also want to ask Jim about the results of my own DNA test. In Orkney, we found really the same findings as others have found. There's one major genetic risk factor. It's a genetic variant called DRB1-1501, so it's a bit of a mouthful. Yeah, it means not much to me, no, yeah, I'll be honest, it, yeah. It's a, it's a gene that encodes part of our immune system, and it's obviously not functioning exactly right uh, in many people um, who have MS. Uh, so I, I had a, a DNA test because I was interested. I know you can do DNA. I know I've got MS already, but do I have this DRB blah blah gene? So here it is. Uh, I don't know. I've had a look at it, but I don't really know what it means. Perhaps you'd like to... OK. Let's have a look. ...unveil it. Let's have a look and see, see what it says. Let's see. Genetic results. Marker. Ah, oh, there we go. HLA. That's the one. And you do not carry the <laughs> DRB1-1501. <laughs> Have I ruined your theory now? <laughs> no, no, not, not at all. It's because these are risk factors, and that's quite hard to, to, for people to understand. Mm. You can be at heightened risk of something but not get it. But risk I've still factor. got it. So You've still got it, but there are a number of other genes they've tested here, um, including interleukins, so they're sort of messengers in the immune system. Right, okay. And you carry a couple of those risk factors. Has anyone in your family in the past had...? No, we've got... Uh, what? is interesting to me anyway. I've got MS, which is autoimmune. Mm -hmm. My mother, uh, my maternal grandmother and my sister all have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. And I had a sister who had cancer, also autoimmune. I'm the only one that's got MS. But that's so. really interesting because from a genetic perspective, there are a number of variants that are shared across different autoimmune diseases. Mm. So there can be a propensity to having an autoimmune disease. So, I mean, finding a, a cure for an incurable disease, it's, it's, it's not just finding, like, antibiotic, well, that'll fix your cold. It's not going to be that simple, is it? No, it's a big job, but if you understand what's gone wrong, then you stand a chance of fixing it. I think genetics is the first step on the journey towards understanding this disease and eventually solving it. I may not have the gene variant most closely associated with MS, 
but I've inherited a predisposition to some kind of autoimmune disease. Luck of the draw, I guess. I'm just going to use your chair as a support. You're very well. Later that day, I go to a talk that Jim Wilson is giving to the islanders about his research. Here's a map of how common MS is across the world. And as you get nearer and nearer to the equator, it becomes uh, less and less common. And it's actually Many people in the room have MS or have relatives with the disease. Finding genes is only ever the first stage on the journey. For the first time in years, I don't feel like the odd one out. The sense of community, it's, it's actually really comforting. I feel you're no longer alone. Yeah, absolutely. It's also the first time I've ever talked to other people with MS. In my brain, I'm not disabled yet. No, no. And I don't I know, yeah, how long have you had it? Um, about a year and a half now. OK. Oh, recently diagnosed. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's the end of a very long day here in Orkney. I think the thing that most surprised me was how emotional I got, actually, just listening to Jim Wilson's talk um, about the possible uh, causes or triggers uh, for the disease, um, I really felt like blubbing up. I've coped with this disease for so long on my own, 17 years, and I don't think I ever appreciated just how isolated um, I have been. So, night night, see you tomorrow. Next morning, I do a bit more sightseeing. It's even colder than yesterday. Just six degrees centigrade with 60 kilometre an hour winds. It's not hard to understand how the islanders can find themselves seriously deficient in the sunshine vitamin. I can't believe we are just a week away from June and it feels like the deepest, darkest winter. You can see there's just no sunshine and it's so windy. Still, the cold didn't deter all of the locals. <laughs> I can't move! Later, Hayley, the young woman I'd met at Jim Wilson's talk, comes to meet me for a cup of tea and a chat. Hayley's 23 and has the same type of MS as me, the relapsing remitting kind. She was only diagnosed 18 months ago. Hayley, hi there, how are you? Not too bad. I know the symptoms of MS vary from person to person, but I didn't realise by how much. Um, well, I thought I was losing my eyesight. There was double vision, there was things blocking my vision, like mm. floaters in my eyes. The worst relapse I had, I just couldn't stop being sick, like for hours I was being sick and I really thought I was going to die. My mm. head was that sore. Okay. I just thought I'm dying. I really thought I was going to die. I woke up in the morning and I couldn't get out of bed. Oh, God. I couldn't even sit up by myself. You, no strength? No anything. I've never had been anywhere near the point where I haven't been able to get out of bed. I would have been freaking out. <laughs> I was a little bit. I have had numb skin, double vision, balance problems have been... My balance is rubbish now, which is why I fall over a lot. Have you ever felt like your, your skin's burning? Yes. When it gets... It, it feels itchy and when you scratch, no, it burns. when it feels like it's going to melt away. No, I've not had like that it's one. Like on fire. No, I've not had that. Um, so when you were diagnosed, how did it make you feel? I took the week off work and I did a lot of reading. I did a lot of crying, um, you know, and I drank a lot and I smoked a lot. I did the, all of that for a week. I was like, I didn't know what to feel that night. Mm. And the first thing I thought was, what am I going to write on Facebook? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's good to share experiences with another MSA. Like me, Haley's determined not to let MS dictate her life. I don't want to be that girl with MS. I just I just want to be normal. I want to be normal. I just want to be that girl. Yeah, yeah. My time in Orkney has come to an end. I've learned that both the environment and genetics play a part in my disease. I can't change my DNA but I can possibly reduce the severity of my MS symptoms through regular sunshine.
have also learned more about the symptoms of MS by meeting others with the condition. My next destination, England. I'm here to meet someone who lives on the outskirts of London. I was diagnosed with MS in my early 30s, but it can strike at any time. I'm keen to find out how the disease affects someone diagnosed in childhood. Hello, Hello. Angela. Yeah. Angela was just 14 when her MS attack started. Thank you. She's 18 now and her symptoms are already quite severe. I think the main one is really bad fatigue. I get really tired quite quickly. It's not just a tiredness or laziness, it is an overwhelming sense of tiredness. But I also get really, really bad headaches, and I don't mean just like the odd migraine. These are like crushing headaches. Really? And it can last all day, as I'm in so much pain. I've been starting to have problems with my walking now, which is obviously a bit frightening for me mm. and my parents. How often do you get symptoms? At least every day. At really? Le at least every day now. It is upsetting, and my doctor did say to me, the first day I got diagnosed, he asked me, what is your career path? And I was like, oh, I want to be a dancer. Mm. And he just said, I don't know if you'll be able to walk by the time that you're the age of 25. Um, so that did hurt. That did really, really hurt. I'm getting worse, and I know I'm getting worse. And how do you feel about that? It's, it's scary. It's scary, but what else can I do? I can't exactly sit around and mope around feeling sorry for myself. Just got to get on with life, and if it's hitting me with this, I'm just going to go and face it head on. Yeah. Angela may have given up on her dreams of becoming a professional dancer, but she hasn't given up dancing. Despite her fatigue, she attends classes three times a week. I sit in on one with her mother, Lydia. It's great to see Angela smiling. I feel very moved by her courage. Blinding headaches and extreme fatigue are common with MS. Watching Angela, I'm thinking how lucky I am not to suffer these symptoms. I've also had 15 years without disability, but I fear for Angela's future. Her mother, Lydia, finds it impossible to contain her emotions. So I take her outside. I don't want to see her end up in a wheelchair. No, no, no mother does. I just couldn't accept it. I just can't. Yeah. Give me a hug. You need a hug. It's going to be OK. It is going to be OK. I know. I know. I'm really sorry I've upset your mum, no, and I don't want to okay. upset her. So... You silly goose. <laughs> I'm fine, sweetheart. Just I'm praying to God that God will discover one person, just one person to discover that can cure a mess. And I too hope for a cure for MS. Now even more than when I started my journey. What will the scientists tell me? My dream is to one day be able to walk without a stick. I've had MS, an incurable disease of the central nervous system, for over 17 years. I've come to the UK to find out if a cure is possible. I have an appointment with a leading scientist who can answer that question. But first, there's someone else I want to meet. Hey, Sanjay. Hi, oh, Stephanie. How are you doing? I'm all right. How are you? A little bit wet. Around one in four people who have MS eventually end up in a wheelchair. That's my great fear, 
and I really want to find out how someone in that situation manages to cope. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Like me, Sanjay was first diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS. Sip of tea? Oh, please. Oh. Right. But okay. after about 15 okay. years, that Oops. changed into the secondary progressive kind. This means you get increasingly disabled right. without any periods of remission. Emotionally, you know, I really felt a sense of major loss and increase in dependency. Um, and, and suddenly this person in a wheelchair. On the flip side, I'm incredibly grateful. In, can, in what uh, way? I know it's, it's a certain that madness. That sounds kind it? of weird, it's yeah. There's a certain madness there that I can still see, I can still hear. Um, I've still got all my bits and bobs. So do you have a, a nightmare scenario? Yes, the, if I got to a point where I couldn't um, talk, visually see, um, and not being able to swallow. Are there any regular drugs that you can take to kind of minimise or assist mm. you uh, in your own, in the MS? Um, I think there are many more treatments for relapsing and remitting uh, MS, but for progressive MS, there are not many, well, I don't think there are any effective treatments. I'm at that point where I'm worrying that I might be going secondary progressive. You're secondary progressive? Yeah. You've still just got to get on with it. Um, mm. So look, hopefully it's not going to happen to you. You're not going to be in a wheelchair. And there are many people that don't yeah, with MS. I don't want that. Yeah. I really admire Sanjay's philosophical approach to being in a wheelchair. But right now, if I'm truly honest, I'm not sure it's something I could cope with. It's also worrying that there are no effective drug treatments for Sanjay. Can scientists come up with a cure for progressive MS? I really hope so. Today, I'm in Cambridge. I'm feeling much more positive. It's the day I'll find out if there's hope for a cure. According to international newspaper reports, scientists at Cambridge University made a major breakthrough in MS research. So do I dare to hope, or is it all just hype? This is the man who can tell me. Robin Franklin, Professor of Neuroscience. Hi there, Stephanie. Hello there. I'm Robin How... Franklin. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you too. Yeah. So listen, the lab is a little way off, so why don't we um, head off there and we can have a chat about okay, things Okay, fine. There. Lovely. So come on through. This is pretty much what biology labs look like the world over. Um, it looks all very simple from making so many great discoveries, quite frankly. Oh, it's all very simple. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, I don't believe him. Now, people, this is the scientific bit, so pay attention. Actually, this, this figure here actually illustrates this quite, quite nicely. Now, this is the myelin sheath, a membrane which wraps around the nerve fibre. The myelin sheath protects the nerve fibre and stops the nerve fibre from degenerating. So what happens in multiple sclerosis is that your immune system starts destroying your own tissue. It takes the myelin sheath right off the nerve fibre. And, and the crucial thing is that the myelin sheath can be regenerated, but the nerve fibre can't be regenerated. Or, or not as easily at any rate. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the trick is to make sure that you repair the myelin so that you don't lose the nerve fibre. What we've discovered is that, that actually the brain and spinal cord has a very abundant population of stem cells. And these cells are the cells that respond to the loss of the myelin sheath. Professor Franklin's team, in collaboration with Edinburgh University, made a groundbreaking discovery. They found a special molecule called RxR that can stimulate stem cells already in the brain to transform into the kind of cells that make myelin. Still with me? We can now begin the process of developing drugs that will be the regenerative medicines of multiple sclerosis. Now, the hope is that regenerative medicines would be a way of, of addressing the progressive phase of the disease. At worst, slowing it down. If we're really lucky, it'll stop it. And if we're really, really lucky, we'll stop it sufficiently for the body to regain some function. 
So how close are we uh, to a cure? And the common timeline that the industry would give for drug development from a laboratory breakthrough to clinical intervention is between 10 and 15 years. A cure for MS will hopefully come in time for people newly diagnosed with the disease, so they avoid disability. And that's really exciting. But sadly, any cure may come too late to prevent me from needing a wheelchair. I've come to Suffolk in South East England. I'm visiting Mum. Right. Yeah. Take my badge. Today, the sun's shining. Hooray! So we're off to the seaside. Mum and I seldom talk about my MS. That's probably a British thing. Stiff upper lip and all that. Welcome to Southwold. But she's told me she's got something she wants to discuss. There's the sea. It's a holiday weekend and the beach in Southwold is crowded. We Brits do love our warm weather as it's so rare, even if it's not quite warm enough for some people to do without coats. I last saw Mum two weeks ago when I flew over from Malaysia for her 70th birthday. I've had another MS attack since then, but Mum hasn't said anything. Well, not yet. <sighs> We're just one of those families that don't talk well, about it. We don't talk about it too much because I don't feel as though I want to be nagging you all the time. But obviously, I do, I do get concerned because there is a difference this year from a year ago. Yeah, and, I know, um, yeah. So th that, is, that is a worry for, for me. Getting in the car, and um, it, it looks really painful for you. I know our car's smaller than the one we had before, but... Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not painful, it's just awkward. And then you had that fall, didn't you, in the shower? That was really worrying to me, because, I, you know, I wondered if you'd hit your head or anything like that. Yeah, no, my head was fine. Yeah, I was yeah. just stuck. Uh, I thought, oh, my God, what's she like at home where I can't see her? Yeah, and I think... Mum spends the next half yeah, hour doing exactly what she said she wouldn't. So you could actually still Nagging. Get some bars put up. Yeah, yeah, no, I think about getting a railing in the... Yeah, the, as you know, shower. you can get mobility, little scooters, yeah, in fact, and also the medical facilities and things like that. Yeah, and Try and get them all, all near. Well, and also, Stephanie, it's not a failing in you that you're asking somebody for help. I know, but you kind of... Bless her. I know it's because she worries about me. And finally, Mum comes out with what she really wants to say. It will be great if you came back here, really. I know that's not what you want to do, but it would be good because we'd always be there to help you, um, which is a mother's instinct, isn't it, really? What is she like? I'm not planning to come back any time soon, but it's good to know Mum's there if I need her. You were probably a, about 12. It was yeah. a pre-hoodie. It was a hoodie before hoodies yes. ran in. Yeah. I love that sweater. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my marathon medal. Mm. You were always sporty, weren't you? And, mm. um, it's always nice to come home and see Mum and my stepdad, yes. Brian. But talking yeah. about my MS today and, brings um, back painful memories. My sister, Karen, was there when I told them I had MS. Karen died 11 years ago of Hodgkin's disease, another autoimmune illness. She had cancer and I've got an incurable disease and it's like... <sighs> you don't want to have to tell your parents that kind of crap, but you get on with it and we're still going 20 years later almost and we're going to be OK, but... It still sucks. I'm getting more and more anxious that my MS is turning progressive. I love my job, but realistically, I wouldn't be able to report from the field in a wheelchair. There are drugs to prevent MS attacks, but up till now, I've chosen not to take any because of the side effects.
Now, though, the benefits may outweigh the risks. I have an appointment tomorrow with my London consultant. Drugs only work with relapsing remitting MS, and I'm afraid of what he'll tell me. To be honest, I'm freaking out. So I go to visit my good friend Jill for a free psych consultation. She has the knack of asking me the questions I'd rather avoid. Realistically, day to day now, I mean, I know it's one thing sort of externally putting on a face. We both know you're possibly one of the most stubborn people on the earth. So at what really? point... <laughs> just a little. So do you, I mean, being honest with yourself, I know you've always said that your passion is for being out in the field, but mm. could you not, if you absolutely had to, think about adjusting to a desk-based job? Not unless someone was holding a gun to my head. Um, <laughs> Um, I can't imagine myself doing a death job right now. Um, that would that would feel like a death sentence. It, it really would. Yes, it may take me a bit longer to walk down the street, but does that really matter? And like I say, I'm not in a war zone. It's not like the ability to run is actually really important. You're going to see your consultant tomorrow, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. When did I, I saw him last, last saw him two years ago, so he certainly hasn't seen me since I've been walking full-time with a stick. Mm. Um, and I'm re I am really scared, actually, that he's going to say, oh, well, I think you've got secondary progressive now. And, and, and that will be a, oh, you know, kind of moment. How yeah. are you going to cushion yourself? I haven't actually thought it through. I don't want to think about it. Because that, to me, it would be like a bit like the... Does that mean it's game over? Because I can't. There's, what they say is once you've gone secondary progressive, you you don't take drugs anymore mm. because there's no point. There's no drug option at all at no. that point. Progressive doesn't equate to game over because it, it isn't game over. It isn't sayonara. I know. And you've got you know friends and family around you and all kinds of coping strategies that have proved to be really valuable over the last few years. We can deal with it together, whatever it is. That's been the case so far, and I'm sure that'll be the case still. Cool. That's the deal. Got ya? Yeah. <laughs> Got ya. You made me cry, Gillian. <laughs> <laughs> You're OK. You're not alone. <laughs>
you saying, oh, you've gone secondary progressive and, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, that's the end of my life. I mean, you know, I may be being overly dramatic. Be. No, I know. And don't forget, you're somebody that's actually never taken treatment. Mm. And I'd say you're a little bit better than the average, um, you know, 16, 17 years in. I have chosen up to now not to take any drugs in the past for various reasons, side effects, benefits and so on. Uh, but I'm about to start uh, on a new drug next week. Um, is it the right time for me? I mean, should I have done this before? Well, it's certainly the right time, because before you were getting over your attacks very well. Mm. And with each attack, you're now getting some problem. Mm. So it, common sense says, let's stop those. And, the, you know, you've got a choice of a lot of drugs. You've chosen one that's very effective. So there's a good chance that it'll work for you. We are very lucky at the moment that we've got a lot of options. One or two of the newer drugs are so powerful that people are talking about remissions, lack of disease activity, if you like, that stretches into the horizon. We don't know when it's going to ever come back. And that would be great, quite frankly. It would yeah. be great. Uh, the difficulty is the more powerful the drug, of course, the more the side effects usually. Mm. And so again, it's a case of judging when to use something. I can cope with walking with a stick. Uh, so if I didn't get any worse, from that, that would be fantastic. I can't tell you how relieved I am having spoken to Dr Kapoor. I'm not secondary progressive, that is a massive weight off. And if I could skip down the street, I would. And I can't move. <laughs> Sorry. Shall we do that again? <laughs> In a week's time, I'm due to start the new medication prescribed by my doctor in Malaysia. Before I do, I'm keen to meet someone who's already taking that drug. Hello, Suzanne. Hello, Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Suzanne also has relapsing remitting MS. She's had it slightly longer than me, 20 years. The good news, the drug she's taking and the one I'm due to take can reduce future MS attacks by 50%. I don't need my stick today. I'm having a, having a good day, as they say. The bad news, it has serious possible side effects, including the risk of heart failure when you take the first dose, and macular edema, a swelling in the eye, which can cause loss of vision. Oh, yeah, it's not without its risks. No, and it's like, you know, um, and my friends, and I start to say to my friends, oh, I'm taking this new drug, it's going to be really good for my AMS. And they say, oh, that's great, what are the side effects? They say, well, I might have a heart attack and my eyes might explode, but other than that... <laughs> bit of black well, you humor, don't but... know, though, do you? No, it could have happened. Some people have, have died happened. at the yeah, end of the I day. Think... But if you survive the first tablet, you survive the heart attack, that's it, you can stop worrying about it. So how, how long have you been on it now? Three months now. Three months now, yeah, yeah. It's cool. Um, and I have, I have to say, I have started to notice a difference. Um, I just feel um, my walking is a little bit better. But that's kind of what I'm really looking forward to. To improve your uh, walking. To improve my walking, Specifically, yeah. 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 I, mean, oh, I really yeah. hope it does. Oh, I do. When I do you go on it? Um, where are we? End of May. A uh, couple of weeks' time. So it's pretty, know I know, D-Day is approaching. Yeah. I am quite nervous. It's early days. Suzanne's only been taking the drug for three months, but her good experience gives me hope the new medication will work for me too. My visit to the UK is now over. I've discovered a cure for MS is genuinely possible, but may come too late for me. However, there is a chance that my new medication could stop my MS from getting worse. And that would be fantastic. Time to head home to start my treatment. I've been back in Kuala Lumpur for a few days now. I'm on my way to the hospital to start my new medication. The first dose has to be monitored because of the risk of heart failure. Hello, how are you? This is Dr Hamadan, my Malaysian consultant. Yeah, looking forward to the pill. We monitor your blood pressure, heart rate every hour until six hours. From your baseline, now it's about 70. It mm -hmm. goes down less than 50, and then we'll be worried. OK, mm. fingers crossed. First, the ECG, to check my heart can cope. 
Okay, so this is the last check before the pill. Yep. Do I look worried? You do. <laughs> it has gone up a bit, yes. No, That's anxious. the caffeine. I know you're anxious. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame the caffeine. The big moment has arrived. Each pill costs around 100 US dollars, and I need to take one a day. Stephanie, this is your pill. All right, thank you. OK. Here goes. The six-hour countdown okay. begins. Done. This is funny. I updated my Facebook status a while ago saying, um, I'm about to take my new medication and I don't know if I'm going to make it. I've already had a couple of panicked messages back. I guess what I have to do in six hours' time is just to announce to the rest of the world I am still alive and I'm sure I will be. <laughs> Nurses check my heart rate every hour. Your pulse rate, 82. Your oxygen, 96. It's just the first dose that carries a Thank significant you. risk you. of brachycardia, a slowing of the heart yeah. that can be dangerous. Five hours later, and my pulse rate's gone down from 82 to under 60. 58. <laughs> I'm trying not to worry. Yes, I need to inform him if the beep, uh, pulse rate goes down to 50. I'm alive! I'm oh, you're alive! alive. I know. <laughs> And your pulse rate has been okay. Any problems in between, just call my, my nurse and I'll see you in the clinic. Yeah, okay. No worries. Okay. okay. All right, take care, thanks. Okay. Bye. Yes. You know, I know we were joking about it earlier, but uh, it is a relief that I have survived the first day and I am still alive, obviously. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just feels like an, uh, another chapter. What happens next, I have no idea, but it's another chapter. Who knows what the future holds? One thing I do know, I won't give up on my dreams. In my dreams, I dive. In my dreams, I am not disabled. <laughs>